Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. John Bierling, who is the recipient of the 2023 Alumni Council's Distinguished Alumnus Award. Dr. Bierling is Professor of Medicine and Surgery and Chief of Hepatology and Director of the Baylor Liver Health at the Baylor College of Medicine. He is the Director of Advanced Liver Therapies. And it's interesting, he his looking at his incredible career, so much of it began with transplant work, and so much of it is with prevention of disease from hepatitis B and hepatitis C, thereby hopefully eliminating the need for more transplant work. So he's worked both ends of it. Um, and his philosophy, I kind of looked up some things as a, a laboratory bench to bedside. So I think, you know, the U of R model continues throughout. So John, thank you so much. Thank you, Tom, for that kind introduction. It's a real honor to give this lecture, but I do so with trepidation because I recognize that only I stand between you and lunch. These are my disclosures. Lay knowledge is unfortunately limited to only four of the five vital organs. And the ignorance about the liver has profound consequences in communication with patients, their families, society at large, as well as funding agencies. And that's paradoxical because hepatology in antiquity was well recognized where the liver was used to augur the future as early as 4,000 years ago. In antiquity, they also recognized the signs of liver disease, principally jaundice, ascites. They even developed large volume of abdominal paracentesis. And that background should have accelerated our field, but it did not. It was only in the Renaissance that we got good studies of vascular anatomy and the complexity of the liver from Leonardo da Vinci to Glisson. And only in 1685 was the first description of cirrhosis, the common final pathway to many etiologies of liver disease. Now, the reason that the Renaissance was stymied was Galen's endorsement of Hippocrates' notion that liver was a source of four vital humors, and the imbalance of those humors were responsible for all disease. And this ignorance persisted until 1858, if we can believe that in a modern audience such as ours. Now, the advances in hepatology in the early and mid 20th century included progress in physical and biological sciences, and most noteworthy advances in laboratory medicine, where we were able to measure bilirubin, key enzymes related to liver injury, the prothrombin time, and hepatic clearance tests. We had advances in clinical knowledge that led to the classification of jaundice uh, and to the uh, designation of abnormal bilirubin metabolism. We recognized three autoimmune diseases and also recognized three genetic metabolic diseases. Now, influential mentors in my choice of an academic career began with Don Kennedy, uh, my chair and mentor and subsequent president of Stanford University, who taught me that discovery science really is fun, exciting, and gratifying. And also my thesis advisor, uh, Arthur Giza, who taught me that an academic's legacy wasn't in their publications. It was in the success of their trainees. Now, at Stanford Medical School, I first uh, came under the wing of Nobel laureate and alumnus of Rochester, uh, Arthur Kornberg, who introduced me to bilirubin metabolism and Jill Bear syndrome, which he had. And he stated that every academic owed his or her profession sustained creativity. And that stuck with me. Dr. Gary Gray, a humanist and a triple threat academician, introduced me to the exciting nature of gastroenterology. Now, influential mentors at Strong Memorial Hospital are well recognized by this audience and included uh, Lawrence Young, Chair of Medicine, Will Morgan Jr., Vice Chair and Director of our Residency Program, and George Engel, who with John Romano uh, gave you the biopsychosocial model that is so admired from this institution worldwide. And the two of them uh, collaborated on a classic textbook, uh, The Clinical Approach to the Patient. 
Paul Greiner was a tremendous attending and mentor of mine and now long lifelong friend. Uh, he taught us critical thinking and the need to address unmet needs for progress in the field. Arthur Moss taught us that we must define pathogenesis in order to develop effective therapies for the future. And I want to acknowledge my next door neighbor and close friend in residency, Ray Maeski. Uh, Ray was a leader among us and went on to an illustrious career of leadership positions here at the University of Rochester. And I want to acknowledge uh, his friendship and uh, you know, our time together as residents. Now, I had two years of residency and then I had to report for active duty at the US Public Health Service, where on July 1st, 1974, Alan Wolkoff from Einstein and myself became the first clinical associates in the liver unit at NIH. This was the brainchild of Thomas Chalmers in the top left, uh, who was the clinical director of the NIH Clinical Center. And he enlisted Hans Popper, recently retired dean from Mount Sinai, to come on campus to ensure the success of the unit, because they weren't sure that the two of us were going to be successful. And they appointed as director Paul Burke, a hematologist interested in bilirubin metabolism from hemolytic anemias. So quite a crew to start this uh, uh, process. Hans, who is a consummate clinician and a patopathologist, got us an entree to the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology weekly, a patopathology conference seeing cases from around the world. And it's led by Kamal Ishak in the center photo. And Hai Zimmerman, another illustrious alumnus of this university, was our principal clinical teacher and the father figure for the patotoxicity of medications. In the bottom left, you see Warren Strober, undergraduate and medical school graduate of uh, Rochester, uh, chief of mucosal immunity, uh, who taught me cellular immunology to study what was uh, going on with the inflammation we saw in the patient's liver biopsies. Harvey Alter, another alumnus and 2020 Nobel laureate, uh, involved me in his studies of post-transfusion hepatitis. And that led to my own investigations, ultimately in molecular virology of hepatitis B and C viruses. Erman Sturdley taught me about Wilson disease so I could perform radiocopper labeled studies in patients. And Dame Sheila Sherlock, for some reason, took a liking to me and was an advocate of my research and became a lifelong mentor. Now, beginning in 1950, with the found, uh, founding of the American Association for Study of Liver Diseases, multiple professional societies in the field were subsequently founded. These then sponsored journals, and those uh, journals advanced the science and practice. They provided clinical practice guidelines, and they had cross-disciplinary approaches and provided, uh, provided a forum for the exponential growth in publications you see in the field in the bottom graph. Now, this also coincided with emergence of support for hepatology research. First in foundations, the American Liver Foundation spun off uh, from the AASLD. And I had the pleasure of being the chairman of the board for six years of that uh, group. Subsequent other foundations, including one in the AASLD itself, and their combined efforts, along with the work of many, many other people, led to the solidification of a liver disease branch within NIDDK and a complete divisional status for viral hepatitis in CDC. Now, viral hepatitis has been somewhat of a triumph of diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccine development. And it owes that origin to Saul Krugman, who defined two types of viral hepatitis based on their modes of transmission. Baruch Blumberg discovered hepatitis B virus in 1967 as the principal pathogen for parentally transmitted viral hepatitis and was awarded the Nobel Prize for that in 1976. The progress in prevention has now led to recombinant vaccines that have made this a totally preventable disease and have eliminated its scourge from those countries where it's endemic. It has also become a treatable disease beginning with sort of the, the, the problematic use of interferon, we rapidly then developed the ability to take off the shelf the nucleosides and nucleotides being developed for HIV infection because hepatitis V virus molecularly is a form of retrovirus. 
And the success that we had when we first used lamivudine, as you see in uh, 1995, was incredible. You can imagine what we felt. We took patients awaiting transplant, seriously decompensated. They recompensated and they never needed transplant because of that therapy. And now this is an entirely treatable disease. And in the near future, we hope to be able to cure it. Those drugs are in clinical trials now. Now, Purcell and Feinstone at NIH uh, in 1974 identified hepatitis A virus as the principal cause of oral fecal transmitted viral hepatitis. And because they developed the diagnostics, that led Harvey Alter to test his post-transfusion people and characterize them as having non-A, non-B hepatitis. Didn't know what it was, but that characteristic gave him a cohort that could be studied in transmission studies at CDC in chimpanzees. Now, Michael Houghton at Chiron had an innovative, never before tested uh, technique to try to identify the virus which he did. And it was named alphabetically the hepatitis C virus after hepatitis B virus. And Charlie Rice recognized that hepatitis C virus was part of the Flavi viridae. We know a lot about Flavi viridae, and that opened the doors for enormous rapid progress in potential therapeutics and won them the Nobel Prize well deservedly in 2020. Now, we do not have a vaccine, so prevention it has to mitigate against parenteral risk factors for hepatitis C still. But treatment is now curative. And the fast work of this is an enormous testimony to the integrated work of funding agencies, both public and private, uh, de dedicated work in structural activity analyses by pharma, and you know, just heavy lifting in clinical trial conducted throughout the world. But we can now cure this disease with one pill taken once a day for eight to 12 weeks in virtually 100% of patients. And I've been very gratified to be a principal investigator and an advocate uh, for them in advisory councils in pharma uh, for this accomplishment. Now, decompensated cirrhosis and surgical mortality captivated interests in the 1950s and 60s and was led forward with a child to cop pew score, which most of you kind of cut your teeth on in medical school. We now fast forward with big data analyses and you can find online calculators such as the Penn Vocal Score to calculate the exact risk of your individual cirrhotic patient for a particular type of operation, a clear advance. We recognize that cirrhosis itself is a process. And when it decompensates, it's due to the development of clinically significant portal hypertension. Now we can see on the left that over months, you get decompensating features, but right there where the axes cross, you have a window of opportunity to treat the patient to prevent them from ever advancing to those complications, which of course on the right have profound consequences on their survival. Now this cartoon illustrates what I just said, we have an early phase of cirrhosis with worsening clinically significant portal hypertension with more and more collagen deposits. We get to a later phase and that phase can and should be treated. We know that new drugs can prevent the development of cirrhosis. We know that cirrhosis can be prevented from decompensation and you can even reverse cirrhosis with long-term treatment of five to eight years against the primary cause. When clinically significant portal hypertension is the issue, you have a transjugular intrahepatic portal shunt as an option to decompress the patient. Now, cirrhosis is the primary risk factor for hepatocellular carcinoma worldwide. And that means that every clinician has a stake in recognizing liver disease and getting them the proper treatment to not advance to cirrhosis and to inc incur this risk. Now, orthotopic liver transplantation has dominated our thinking for several decades since the first transplant by Tom Starzl, who was a colleague and mentor and uh, counselor of mine uh, until his uh, death uh, several years ago. And you're all aware that liver transplantation now has excellent long-term success with modern immunosuppression illustrated on the left. And the disparities in access for females on the waiting list has been eliminated by the adoption this year of MEL 3.0. But remember, liver transplant is life-saving, but it is a testimony to the fact that we have not been able to adequately treat patients before they need that life-saving procedure. And there's still more waiting than there are organs to transplant. 
So as the founding medical director of two liver transplant programs in the United States, I had two goals. The first was to provide the best outcomes for our patients using a multidisciplinary, multi-departmental, single cost center approach to that problem. The second was to conduct the research and train the new generation to eliminate the need for transplantation for as many indications as possible, as soon as possible. Here we see the indications in the, in the US in 2021 with rapid rises in alcoholic liver disease and in non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or NASH. You see the plummeting uh, need for transplant in hepatitis C in green, and you'll notice hepatitis B is no longer on this slide because we've eliminated that therapeutically. Alcohol and liver disease is something every clinician needs to be aware of and be involved in. We have about 4.5 million Americans ages 12 and older with alcohol use disorder. The abscissa was cut off here, so I'm gonna to jump to this slide to show the important increases that occurred in different age groups during the COVID epidemic where everyone was home and sheltering and worried and anxious. And we see that the increased mortality that has occurred as a result of all of this has clustered in the younger age groups. This is a national tragedy that we all have a stake in solving. Now, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease has now been renamed metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease, mastled quite a mouthful. And it's the second leading cause in its, its uh, steatohepatitis uh, form for transplants, as I've shown. Now, we have big problems, and everyone's aware of that, of obesity and its consequences. I've shown you the heat map here for uh, the vulnerability of subpopulations that we need to pay strict attention to because their obesity leads to hyperinsulinemia. Hyperinsulinemia is a driving force of all the consequences of metabolic syndrome, including the metabolic liver disease. Now, I want you to be aware of there are three categories of non-invasive testing that are being developed and brought to your use. They involve histopathologic surrogates for fibrosis where you don't need a liver biopsy to do that. MRCP surrogates where you can do quantitative bilimetrics and caliber measurements and quantitative tests of liver physiology using surrogates for uh, portal hypertension and progression. Now the boxed in, uh, in red here are techniques that use transient elastography, and they've had great penetrance. And I would imagine that many of you in the audience have seen results of these tests with liver stiffness as a surrogate for fibrosis. On the right are MRI technologies, MR elastography and MR liver uh, multi-scan. These are available uh, and uh, are endorsed by CMS. This is the first test of what will be many in the near future. Uh, hepatic, which is a non-invasive test of a perfused hepatic mass. And it can calculate all of these different parameters. And you see this patient that's had serial testing on the left with the movement during the course of their illness, indicating the changes in these parameters, which are functional parameters. This is done by scintigraphy analysis from just a liver spleen scan, probably our oldest imaging technology. And it will be supplanted with new tests in the near future. So let me reemphasize, we need to treat the primary disease of all patients. Thus, we need to diagnose the primary disease, and that will prevent progression to cirrhosis. If they have cirrhosis, it will prevent progression to clinically significant portal hypertension and decompensation. If they have decompensation, that treatment can also, in patients, reverse that decompensation. I want you to emphasize in your own minds that we don't have all the answers for therapy, and I want you to encourage your patients to participate in randomized controlled trials so that we can find the answers as rapidly as we have for hepatitis B and C. So fellow alumni, in summary, <clears throat> hepatology has emerged as a dynamic subspecialty during my career. A transplant hepatologist has two major responsibilities ensuring excellent long-term outcomes for all OLT patients and providing excellent care and conduct of research required to prevent the need for OLT in as many indications as possible, as soon as possible. 
And for that latter goal, we all need your help because you are seeing the patients at the earliest stages of their disease. There are abundant clinical and scholarly issues for those in training uh, because this is a rewarding career and there are more tools to meet more unmet needs than we've ever had before. So I encourage trainees in medicine and in all ancillary disciplines to consider a career in hepatology. And for all clinicians in the audience, please stay abreast of rapid advances in diagnostics and therapeutics in liver disease. Treat your patients who have cirrhosis. It's a treatable condition. Encourage patients to enroll in randomized controlled trials and befriend your local hepatologist because together you can have a new dawn. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the excellent talk. My name is uh, Bandu al Jadebi. I'm one of the transplant hepatologists. First of all, I would like to thank you for teaching me about the liver unit more than what I used to know over the last seven or eight years that I have been here. Uh, you touched on a very important topic, liver cirrhosis. The thought in the past that once patient reached liver cirrhosis, it's irreversible, but we have seen cases that patient, they do improve as you stated, once you treat the underlying cause. The issue that we struggle with as a hepatology, who are those patients that we think that most likely they will reverse versus the patient who will continue in the paradigm of double decompensated liver disease despite that you treated the underlying precipitating factor? Well, it's an excellent question and it brings it currently clinical judgment uh, into perspective. And I think that the clinical judgment uh, requires when you're assessing is there progress towards resolution of, with sufficient evidence that it's occurring uh, enough to warrant continued treatment and monitoring rather than calling it a failure and moving only to transplant? And that requires uh, clinical judgment. And uh, I'm reminded of the, of the story when a Japanese uh, CEO of a company was asked if they had a strategic plan. And he said he did, and it was for 250 years. And somebody said, well, what do, you, what do you do to have a 250 year plan? How do you operate that? He says, with patients. So you've got to watch and monitor your patient. They're gonna tell you how they feel. And that's important. We all know that. There's many surrogates that you can now look at to see quantitatively if they're improving. But we've had many, many examples, especially in autoimmune liver diseases, where we've had people literally with offers where the offer fell through, we continued treatment. And I have one such patient's 25 years uh, since they were removed from the list. Another is 18, 19 years now since they were removed from the list. So it takes time, but it's about a five to eight year period of effective therapy of a patient with cirrhosis before you can dissolve that collagen. Well, th thank you very much. Uh, fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you for bringing us through uh, all the, 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 the process and how hepatology start moving up. I'm um, a transplant surgeon. Uh, I deliver transplantation and I, I'm the chief of transplant here at the University of Rochester and it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, my question to you is you clearly show that, you know, uh, the indication for liver transplantation of some viral diseases is coming down or due to the amazing uh, research that has been happening. Alcohol and um, steatohepatitis, fatty livers are going up. And I, my prediction is going to continue going up, and probably you are in agreement with me. Uh, we're trying to do more in the, in the area of trying to get more organ donors. And I think there has been an increase in the United States on, on uh, organ availability. But now there's a, this new field that is coming, calling or revisiting transplant oncology, right? Those patients, you know, with cholangiocarcinoma or those patients with the HCC, which are uh, beyond the normal criteria or the colorectal liver metastasis that uh, we're doing. So this is just increasing the recipient pool and we're not increasing too much the donor pool. That's correct. Where do you think we're gonna go with this? Thank you again. Well, Yogi Berra said that predictions about the future are dangerous. Uh, so I uh, would only tell you 
that it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. And we have a, a sobering statistic, all of us in transplant, and that is the number of organs that we've transplanted has gone up substantially in the past five years, all because of anoxic brain deaths due to fentanyl and other opiate overdose deaths. That is something we first uh, published that. We showed it was anoxic uh, brain injury. We thought it was going to be turn out to be opiates. We didn't have the data for that, but it subsequently has proven to be that. So if we actually solve that problem, which we must solve, we're going to be in even worse shape with access to organs. And I think that all of us have to do what we can do sort of where we are. Remember Teddy Roosevelt said, you know, do what you can with what you have where you are. And from a hepatologist standpoint and a transplant hepatologist, which I am, I want to eliminate the need of people to have that transplant. That's where I can do my best work. That's where I can train people who have basic science and internal medicine and other backgrounds. I want the surgeons to be able to perform the operation with even higher levels of success, which means we have to give them patients that can be operated on and will survive that operation and can be cared for successfully later. We don't want to dismiss that. But there's no way to balance this equation with the increasing need against what should be a decreasing pool of donors if we can solve the opiate epidemic crisis. What pharmacologic treatments will become available for NASH and will they be applicable at later stages of cirrhosis, as you say, the antivirals are applicable at later stages? Well, thank you for that question. The NASH studies are quite robust and it, it is uh, sort of a, a, a little bit of a graveyard of failures uh, in phase three trials. Uh, we have a new drug application uh, that has been filed in September and that will have a fast track and be looked at within six months. There are a couple of other candidates. They all look at individual targets that are metabolic in nature. By definition, this is a metabolic liver disease. And it is likely uh, that it will take a combination of medicines with individual targets combined in the single individual to have the greatest success, which will be the next wave of therapies. And in fact, it's already embedded in some of the studies where they're using uh, the GLP-1 agonists uh, combined uh, with GIP uh, agonisms and glucagon uh, analogs in a single pill. So they're already trying to do this, but we're still way away from it. But, uh, you know, Hippocrates said, you know, that uh, basically uh, food is medicine and let uh, food be your medicine. Um, we have to address this uh, in terms of lifestyle, diet, caloric intake, exercise, it's a societal uh, issue. We know what we could do. We can do it with bariatric surgery. We can do it with uh, the newer weight loss drugs. So we have to apply again, what we have right now, you know, to help uh, blunt uh, this uh, tsunami, which is coming our way. <laughs> 